indeed, how much uh, I love the profession. I found, I keep teasing uh, Boyd uh, when he said uh, that uh, I was his first selection, and I said, <laughs> the first of the fourth or <laughs> the first of the first? But indeed, I love uh, the profession. I found out uh, so up close and personal uh, as I, first of all, my daughter graduated from Western U this year, so we've got, we've got another DO. But I had to leave our white coat ceremony at Rocky Vista right as they're coding to run to the airport. Uh, and I played laser tag with a fellow on a motorcycle there. That didn't help. Uh, and then subsequently waited three hours for the first flight. That one was canceled. And the next one uh, came by. And uh, uh, that went on because of the weather. And about 4 o'clock this morning, I arrived. Uh, one thing didn't arrive, though, is uh, my suitcase. So I apologize, but uh, this is Nordstrom. You look great. Nordstrom. Can tell it. Woo. My wife isn't happy that I didn't get the white shirt, but I. But again, thank you, Paula, for everything you've done to help put me uh, in a position to enjoy uh, the spirit and love of this profession. You know, 40 years ago, as a founding member of AMOPS, my colleagues and I were overcome, overcoming the resistance to be welcomed on the floor of this august body. Consequently, and never ever did I believe I would be standing before you in this capacity. You humble me, you humble us who served our nation. You humble me as a dyed in the wool osteopathic physician. Today, this rethinking of our stance on pressing social economic and philosophical issues, such as we just went through, and the subsequent transformation to acceptance has led to the osteopathic profession's growth and success. It is this belief that is the foundation of my thoughts this morning. I can't possibly do a Will Ferrell. You know, he kind of sang the commencement speech. But let me recite the words of Harry Chapin, who sang, Cats in the cradle in the silver moon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you coming home, Dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then. We'll have a good time then, and we'll all know, and we all know the sun replies, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. Yes, some things change, but in many ways, everything remains the same. To quote another scholar and philosopher who apparently related to cats, uh, A.T. Still said, I have no desire to be a cat which walks so lightly that it never creates a disturbance. I want my footprints to be seen by all. Indeed, it is the continued and persistent disturbances of our present day concept of the profession that I will be speaking to. The three examples of how the profession resisted change and became strong because of the profession's ability to turn threats into opportunities. I will close with several challenges or presumed threats that we need to turn into opportunities to assure the continued growth and prosperity of our profession. Three historic threats turned into booming successes are the embrace of the military, Let's hear it for the military, folks. This one's a little self-serving, the resurgence of for-profit medical universities. And of course, most importantly today, our ACGME transformation. The first example is to recall our deeply rooted military heritage. Remember that A.T. Still enlisted in the Union Army and was assigned to the 9th Kansas Cavalry, Company F. He was a hospital steward, an enlisted rank, buying medical supplies. And he said, indeed, osteopathy was born on the frontier battlefield and almost died there. Dr. Still recalls, during the hottest part of the battle, a musket ball passed through the lapels of my breast jacket, carrying away a pair of gloves. Another passed through the back of my waistcoat, just above the buttons. Because of our growing influence and several notable celebrities, including Mark Twain, on December 13, 1917, then President Theodore Roosevelt responded to Dr. Green of the American Osteopathic Association, 
requesting that osteopathic physicians in the military be given a commission. President Roosevelt responded that he earnestly hoped that Congress would pass legislation enabling osteopathic physicians to serve their country in the capacity in which they were best fitted. Even Teddy's distant cousin, Franklin, tried in vain to recognize osteopathic physicians' ability to serve in the armed forces. It wasn't until 1963 that the U.S. Civil Service Commission announced for its purposes the DO degree was henceforth to be considered equivalent to the MD degree, and in 1966, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara ordered all armed services to accept DOs as military physicians and surgeons. Where is he? Consequently, to use a lollyism, show me the money. Our osteopathic hospitals were now eligible for Medicare, and they flourished. A dear friend of mine and change agent, Robert Bob Klobnik, came to the AOA about that time as the publicity marketing department director. Bob looked around and realized that ads in the Wall Street Journal or Prevention Magazine were absolutely useless unless osteopathic physicians were licensed in all 50 states. We were not in a position to challenge the status quo at, without that recognition. So after achieving that her, her, Herculean task of bringing Louisiana and Mississippi into a path to full licensure, he realized uh, that the osteopathic physicians in the military were being orphaned and not recognized or embraced by their parent the American Osteopathic Association. Therefore, he worked with Colonel Luce from Hawaii in 1977, founded the Association of Military Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons as a state affiliate. Unfortunately, our esteemed board of trustees functioned as a monarchy rather than the metocracy we enjoy today. And I do point to the board, and that is a huge compliment of the metocracy that we do enjoy today. Consequently, it took several years to achieve this delegate status within the House. The argument was we were turncoats and traitors by accepting allopathic residencies in the military. And those of us remember we actually heard that. I shared with you how humbly I stand before you as I look to the Board of Trustees, several of whom have trained in the military residencies and many who have served in the military and public health service. And I point to the military leaders who have represented the osteopathic profession so well. Colonel Strompel, Admiral Scott, Eskey, Jeffries, Army General Volpe, Murray Goldstein, the first DO to reach flag rank, serving as the Assistant Surgeon General of the U.S. Public Health Service, and Surgeon General of the Army Blank, and our recently retired Air Force three-star General Robb. And across the country, every osteopathic commencement ceremony not unlike the 26 military medical officers I commissioned at Rocky Vista, are proudly launching their graduates. Uh, in, it's a new millennium of medical corps officers who will pick up the mantle of whom they follow. The profession fought this innovation, this change, and today we can celebrate it, how some things change but yet remain the same. The second example, for-profit medical schools. By, the 19, by 1920, it had grown rapidly, and osteopathic physicians organized more and more osteopathic organizations at the state and local level. Indeed, the Osteopathic Association flourished, but spurred on by the caustic report of Dr. Abraham Flexner, osteopathic and allopathic medical schools, most of which were proprietary, closed. But those osteopathic colleges that survived established standardized admission criteria, prerequisites, and a structured four-year curriculum required for graduation. Well, in 2006, the profession and ACOM fought to prevent the first proprietary school since the Flexner Report to open in Parker, Colorado, which ironically I have nicknamed the first and the finest. <laughs> because of the institution's top-level COMLEX scores, 100% residency placement into top-tiered residencies, and research leadership in simulation pedagogical research for military medical students. 
This College of Osteopathic Medicine is now following the lead of many of the other great institutions in our profession who have become true universities, providing influence and instruction to other healthcare professionals about the distinct advantage of osteopathic medicine and osteopathic medical education. The profession, again, fought this innovation, this change, and today we can celebrate it, how some things change but yet remain the same. And now to my third point, our transition to ACGME. Peter Drucker, the founder of modern day business philosophy and thinking stated, it is both cheaper and profitable to obsolete yourself than to let your competitors do it for you. And it is without question that we would have been put out of business and stood the potential of our schools becoming required to achieve LCME accreditation, thus completely losing our identity in order for our students to be competitive. So I might add, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, we have become much stronger by assuring that our osteopathic graduates remain completely entitled to seek and achieve residencies and fellowships without strings attached. We do salute the osteopathic residency directors who have surfed this very personal and at times difficult to understand transition for the good of the profession and the future of our so deserving graduates. And it has been tough for them. <laughs> Although not similar in any way, many looked to California as a co comparison. And I say that the, that debacle is recounted in Resurgence, the Rebirth of Osteopathic Medicine in California by Michael Seffinger and even Norm Gevitz in his uh, special communication in the JOA in June of 2014 noted that nationally, the California merger created great solidarity among osteopathic members of state and national osteopathic associations. They rebuffed further effort uh, at amalgamation and championed the continuation of the DO degree. Even after the American Medical Association opened its doors to the DOs to join the state medical associations, as well as the AMA itself, and gave the blessing to them for entering allopathic residencies programs and become MD board certified, the DOs stood fast for their independence, which I expect to continue. The strength and leadership the resurgence brought to California and the nation can and will be reproduced in the single accreditation system. Dr. Zediman, Emeritus Dean of Creighton University and Chair of the ACGME, said that the ACGME's goal is to make both the ACGME and the AOA stronger through the single accreditation system. But we can't achieve this goal without the robust development of osteopathically focused residencies. We must turn our attention to that, and that will be a challenge I present as I close. AT still recruited other MDs to build on what was then a weak and ever-present scientific basis for the practice of medicine. Today, it's our turn to follow in Still's footsteps and recruit MDs into osteopathically focused residencies to enrich their practice of medicine with osteopathic principles and philosophy. The profession fought this innovation this change, and today I believe we can celebrate it, how things change, but yet remain the same. The, the following challenges align with the magnitude of those I previously outlined, yet have yet to be achieved. One, assure the transition of our remaining residencies into the single accreditation system. As you heard yesterday, the process is moving along. We do need to push the primary care folks to finish uh, the goal line. Assure the continuing trend of both osteopathic and allopathic residencies within the single accreditation system to gain osteopathic recognition, particularly our primary care residencies. And they must remain committed to our osteopathic principles and philosophy. You know, remember, the, the, the first degree uh, awarded by the American School was to William Smith, MD, who taught anatomy and extended Still's vision of the osteopathic possibility. We have a great opportunity here, and it is only ours to lose. Three, challenge COCA 
under its new accrediting standards to substantially improve the rigor and accountability of the third year core rotations and give meaning to the fourth year. If our students are... If our students are to remain competitive and continue to match to their first choice residencies, this is a must. Four, eliminate the pettiness and insecurity a member of our osteopathic academic family has proposed via their congressman in the 115th Congress of the United States, H.R. 2373, to amend Title 18 of the Social Security Act to require a second accrediting body specifically for osteopathic residency training programs for the purpose of recognition under Medicare. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. The strong survive through the era of Flexner Report, and we as a profession have committed ourselves to the single accreditation system. We will bring value to the House of Medicine. We don't need a second tier accrediting system to hide residencies and students from colleges of osteopathic medicine who are not competitive. There are enough residencies, this is a little touchy here, okay? There are enough residencies for US allopathic and osteopathic graduates. In 2016, the combined NRMP and osteopathic NMS match offered over 29,000 first-year positions and 23,000 U.S. allopathic, osteopathic, current and prior graduates matched. That's a 6,000 gap if I did it right. It's, that doesn't mean we don't need to start new residencies. It is only a question of our colleges assuring excellence and strong support services for seniors transitioning into residency. Indeed, we must provide more faculty and administrative support for this process in all of our osteopathic colleges. And finally, continue to flaunt our DO pride. Recall Peter Drucker's admonition to obsolete focal areas of your business and consequently bring innovation and strength to your primary business. In our case, as a membership organization serving a predominantly primary care focused membership, we must continue to influence health care policy at the highest levels. The AOA strategy and strategic plan must continue to evolve the business model of the 21st century, for we no longer can simply rely on board certification which is extremely important that we continue to strengthen that. Maintain your membership and help our new generation of DOs understand that no better initials follow a name. That means we must register that pride by membership, not because simply our board certification rests on it, but because our profession and professional identity rests upon it, or not unlike the DDS and the DMD degree, we will become undifferentiated. Indeed, recall Harry Chapin's verse, cats in the cradles, silver moon, spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon, when are you coming home, dad? Well, if A.T. still is our metaphorical dad, who like a cat wanted to create disturbances, can we say, we're gonna be like you, dad? You know, we're gonna be like you and be change agents and embrace our role and responsibility, helping to change the house of medicine, now at times from the inside rather than just from the outside. Dr. Still quietly prayed, Dear Lord, thou great physician, I kneel before thee. Since every good and perfect gift must come from thee, I pray. Give skill to my hand, clear vision to my mind, kindness and sympathy to my heart. Give me singleness of purpose, strength to lift at least a part of the burden of my suffering fellow man, and a true realization of the privilege that is mine, and may I add, that is mine as an osteopathic physician. God bless each and every one of you.